Hello there. We're going to talk about some interesting things today. Uh, the very first video I did, I think the very first video I did, I talked about portals, at, that, that I was going to be talking about portals, and then I, I, I really never did. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, later on in this video. So, so hopefully you'll watch it and, and see, see what it's all about. Um, several, uh, I had several comments over the last little while about the parable of the wheat and the tares. So I thought I'd study that a little bit, the wheat and the tares. So we see a lot of things going on and we go, what the heck, what the heck? You know, with D book and BYU and this, the new hire for the global communication director, all that stuff, you know, and we're just like, what the heck? So the wheat and the tares is a really, uh, some people that I that commented that I really think a lot of um, had some good points that that the wheat is allowed to grow with the tares. So I, I read this and it is really it just kind of blew my mind. Uh, not only this parable but others. So um, I was thinking of going to the Joseph Smith translation of this, but I'm going to stick with uh, the King James. Um, just. Not not because of any great reason. Um, I, there's a, there are a few people who watch this channel that are Christian folks, and I, I try to keep that in mind because if if I do the Joseph Smith translation, they'll immediately dismiss it. <laughs> so and it, th for this purpose, it's just it's just fine. There's a little more clarity, I think, in the in the the JST, but let's, let's do this. So we're in Matthew 13. We're going to start in verse 24. And there's, there's this, uh, little, uh, blurb in here of why Christ wants to speak in parables. And then, and then he gets right into it. Um, another parable, verse 24, put, Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Now, immediately, uh, I thought of this. Um, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto this. So, so the kingdom of heaven. And what, what is the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God? Now, the kingdom of God on earth, for those of us that are uh, card-carrying members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we would say the kingdom of God on earth is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that's what I believe. But let's, let's, let's read, um, this is from, this is from the, the church website on this subject, um, and I'll, I'll quote from it. It says this, Elder James E. Talmadge explained the difference between these two terms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The expression kingdom of God is used synonymously with the term church of Christ. But the Lord had made plain that he sometimes used the term kingdom of heaven in a distinctive sense. In 1832, he called attention to that in these words addressing himself to the elders of the church. This is in Doctrine and Covenants section 65, verses one through six. Such was the prayer, such is the prayer prescribed for these, for this people to pray, not to utter in words only, but to say only, but to pray that the kingdom of God may roll forth in the earth to prepare the earth for the coming of the kingdom of heaven. So the kingdom of heaven, well, let's, let's continue reading. That provision in the Lord's Prayer, the, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, has not been abrogated. We are praying for the kingdom of heaven to come and are endeavoring to prepare the earth for its coming. The kingdom of God, already set upon the earth, does not aspire to temporal domination among the nations. It seeks not to overthrow any existing form of government. It does not profess to exercise control in matters that pertain to governments of the earth, 
Now, I think this can really help us understand the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes this guy wants the kingdom of heaven to, to do its thing here and right now. And I think this quote is really good. So let me finish. Um, it seeks not to overthrow any existing forms of government. It does not profess to exercise control in matters that pertain to the governments of the earth, except by teaching correct principles, trying to get men to live according to the principles of true government before the kingdom of heaven shall come and be established upon the earth with the king at the head. But when he comes, he shall rule and reign for it is his right. And that's from a conference report of 19, April 1916. Okay, so uh, James E. Talmadge, I love that. So, so when we see these parables, and we're going to get into a few of them here, another parable he put forth saying, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So this is the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes we're thinking, oh, no, this is the kingdom of God. So um, let's continue to read the parable, knowing that the kingdom of heaven is sometime in the future when Christ comes and reigns. Okay, verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Now, personally, I think this is preparing for the kingdom of heaven. So their seeds sowed, they were good seeds, and then as the enemy came and sowed bad seeds or tares, okay, weeds. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seeds in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? The tares, right? And he said, or, or, or the wheat, probably. And he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tares, okay, so it is the tares, ye root up the wheat with them. Totally makes sense, right? You can visualize this. The ground's moist and tender. The tares look a lot like the wheat, and so you can't tell until they spring up. And if you pull the tares out, you're going to uproot the, the wheat as well. And so he says in verse 30, Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, so he's going to pull the tares out then, okay, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn, okay? The barn, and we're going to talk about that in just a second because we have another uh, um, scripture that says the garners, which is a similar thing. It's a storage place. It keeps it keeps the wheat protected from the elements, from rodents, and all those kind of things. Now, the very next parable in verse thirty-one, and I'm still in Matthew thirteen. Another parable parable put forth unto them, saying, "The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, seed which a man took and sowed in his field. Which seed is the least of all seeds? But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs." and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. This, is the, this to me, is the epitome of the millennial reign. It, we, we are going to see and witness everything. We're going to have an understanding of the creation of the earth and all these things, because light will, will be here. Christ will be here. And we'll all have our, our own uh, Urim and Thummim, if you will. And we'll be able to, to have knowledge and understanding. And so just a tiny little grain will sprout forth with just massive amounts of energy and food and all these, all these things. 
It's so wonderful. And then, and then alike, and then another parable, verse 33, another parable spake unto them, the kingdom of heaven, again, is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. Um, again, a little tiny bit of leaven and it, it produces, right? And, and this is what's going to take place. Um, this is this is like what what Tesla had had envisioned, I think, where uh, this 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 power source would be free to all and wireless and go, and we would all not the car, right? Not the car <laughs> that's right now that <laughs> you just see all those cars parked in Chicago that couldn't get charged up. Anyway, it's not funny, but. Um, if you have a Tesla, it's not funny. If you don't, you're laughing. But um, uh, yeah, so so just um, very small amounts of of something will create wonderful things. So so this is what we're looking forward to the second coming. Now we'll get back to the parable of the wheat and tares in just a second. Actually, let's let's talk about this. Let's talk about the wheat and tares. And then, then let's go to some other parables where it's the kingdom of heaven. So so we have to discern between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God has been here since Adam and it comes and goes with apostasy and that's why this is the the restored church, right? Because restoration means it was here before. So so we have we have the wheat and the tares. A couple of interesting things. First off, it was an enemy that planted the tares. So it wasn't invited by the the servants or the um, uh, a, a man who who sowed seeds in his field, right? And then the servants uh, participated with him. It was the enemy that came unbeknownst didn't know they were coming. He wasn't invited, right? So we, we always have to make that distinction. We don't want things invited in that we invite in. Now, when, it, when it's concerning the church, I like that quote where the kingdom of God doesn't participate, doesn't, doesn't do anything with the, with the governments of the, of the earth. Um, I have to rethink these things now. Um, in all reality, they ought to, that's like the render under Caesar what's Caesar and unto God is God's. That's the kingdom of God. Um, I think it, uh, as a church, and uh, I, I'm a nobody in the church, so I don't, I'm not speaking for the church. I'm not speaking against the church. But, but in my simple mind, I'm thinking that the church would, would benefit by staying out of anything that is political or anything that's pushed by the government as well, i.e. jabs, you know, things like that. But, you know, like I say, I'm a nobody and, and, and I, you know, I can have my opinion and I can run my life the way I feel like I should and still be part of the kingdom of God, right? Uh, trying to separate myself uh, when it comes to spiritual matters from the world and from the governments of the world. So, but then, but then the tares are gathered and they're burned. They're separated they're separated. So, so this is, this is really interesting because eventually they do, uh, they do meet the end of the fire. And, um, we're, we're, we'll talk more about that in, in, uh, uh, well, let's, let's go to that right now. Let's go to a couple more scriptures that are similar to that. They're not necessarily parables, but they're, but they're, uh, of, of like mind. Let's go to Matthew um, uh, 25, uh, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So this is the kingdom of heaven again. 
The five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. So they had their lamps, they had oil in their lamps, but they didn't take any oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. So they had the little vessel and their lamps with oil in. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, the wick on the lamps, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. So the oil, they had oil, they were burning oil, but the oil in their lamps had burned out and they had no uh, vessel of oil. Then, uh, um, but the wise answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage and the door was shut. In other words, the wheat was gathered and put in the garners and the door or the, the barn, the barn is what we first read, and it was shut. It was shut for protection. And then, you know, and the burning took place for those that were shut. What, what's, another, what's another story that's, that's like that? We can go to, um, let, let's go to the Book of Mormon. Let's go to the Book of Mormon. And I think it's Alma 26, I believe. Um, I might be wrong on that, but let's take a look. Yeah, Matthew, or excuse me, Alma 26, verse 5. Behold, the field is ripe, and blessed are ye, for ye did thrust in your sickle and did reap with your might. Yea, all the day long did ye labor, and behold the number of your sheaves, and they shall be gathered into the garners that they are not wasted. So there you go. That's that's really, really good. Um, we can go back to Matthew, and uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. Let's, let's read that and see what that says. Matthew 3, 12. Oh, this is really good. This is John the Baptist. Of course, that was the mission of Ammon, the stories of Ammon and all that. And they, they were, you know, some of the greatest missionaries in the Book of Mormon. And, and, and they, they reaped, right? Now, now, this is really interesting. Um, this is John the Baptist. I'll just start. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now listen to this. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, the threshing floor, and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is John the Baptist speaking about what Christ is gonna do. So the garner again, uh, or the barn, or uh, and then the garner was also mentioned in, in, uh, in uh, Alma. Now, if we go, if we go to, um, if, if we go to Genesis, uh, this is really good because now this will kind of, come full circle. Uh, and if we go to Genesis 7, listen to this. Genesis 7. Um, and they went in unto Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh. Male and female. Hmm. Interesting. As God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Or in other words, the door was shut. What, what is similar with all these things? There's a separation. There's a separation between the wheat and the tares. There's a separation. And the wheat is protected in the garners. The wheat is protected in the barn. The wheat is protected in the ark. And the door is shut. Okay? So... 
Um, we are growing up as wheat and tares, and we want to be worthy. We want to be spiritual. We want to be kind. We want to be loving. Uh, we want to be in service of our fellow man so that we can uh, be assured that we are going to be protected. Now, for me, the garner, the garner is our home and the temple. The temple is where we make covenants. The ark is where the ark of the covenant. <laughs> There's a reason why these things are all similar. The ark was a a, an abode of covenant keepers that protected them. The temple is a place of covenant makers and keepers. So the garner, the threshing floor, that you can go right back to David purchasing the threshing floor from Ornan the Jebusite, which became the site of the first temple of his son Solomon. That threshing floor was purchased and that it's so symbolic of separating the wheat from the chaff, the wheat and the tares, there's a separation. Now, some people have accused me and people like me that we are separating ourselves from the church. And, and that's just the furthest thing from the truth, furthest thing from the truth. We're separating ourselves from things within the church that seem uh, worldly. <laughs> let's just say, or of Babylon. We're very connected to the church, very connected to the temple. So um, we're, we're typically like the servants who would say, hey, there's tares here, right? There's tear, there are tares among us. What, what, and tares can be, as I was thinking this, I think tares can be both people and or uh, uh, true or false, ter tares can be people or false doctrine, okay? And the wheat can be people or true doctrine, true doctrine of Christ and, and the gospel of Christ. So, so if you think of it as people, then you, you kind of have to gear your thinking in that parable towards people. If you're thinking of thoughts, and and or teachings then then it, it has a, a slightly different meaning but both of them i think are effective thinking of them as individuals the tares are individuals the wheat's individuals and the tares are, are both doctrine taught uh whether it's false and uh, with the tare side or wheat as um as the pure doctrine of christ would be taught so uh, in any place that wheat has to be protected somewhere and it's protected within the covenant. It's protected within the covenant. And that's why it's so important for us to make and keep covenants and, and baptism being the gateway covenant, the gateway covenant. Um, for Christ once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Um, um, uh, I, I've lost my train of thought. But the uh, while the ark was a preparing were in few, that is eight souls were saved by water. They were saved by the baptism of the earth, the cleansing, the cleansing purpose of the earth, which they were encompassed in the, in the ark or the temple uh, of, of covenant. So that's, uh, uh, that was my study on wheat and tares and the, and, and other parables. Um, we could also, uh, let's see, there's, was there one other, uh, parable? Let's see if there was one other parable that we might want to talk about. Um, I think that's that's it for right now. Uh, well, let, let's finish. Let's finish the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, so the door was shut. After afterward came also other virgins, saying, "Lord, Lord, open uh, open to us." 
But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. That's why we watch. And then, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents. So this is the parable of the talents. This again is the kingdom of heaven. It has a whole different meaning, doesn't it? When we think of it as the beginning or during the millennial reign, right? And unto he gave five talents to another two and to another one, to and then and to another one, to every man according to his several ability and straightway took his journey. Then he that hath had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them another five. You guys know that you, you know the the story of this parable. The bottom line is again, there's a separation. There's a separation. And those that that um, obey God's commandments and and live worthy to have the Holy Ghost in their lives, um, everything's multiplied, multiplied, multiplied. And those that don't, it's taken away. There's a separation. So all these parables to me have to do with um, either the huge blessing of being part of the millennial reign. Um, and, and be here with Christ and, and other like-minded people, or you're not, you're consumed, and uh, you go uh, to a place where there's weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth, right? And we don't wanna go there. So, um, okay, there's that. Now, I wanted to talk about one other thing. Um, in our reading with Nephi, uh, First Nephi, we have this interesting uh, segment, and I think it's in uh, uh, um, 17. Yeah. So this is where Nephi gets the inspiration to, to build a ship, um, and all these wonderful things start happening. And it's not a ship like men build. This is, this is after the manner of God. And where does Nephi go? He goes into a cave, I think. Because let's read it. Uh, this is uh, chapter 17, verse 7. And it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had been in the land of Bountiful for the space of many days, the voice of the Lord came unto me, saying, Arise and get thee into the mountain. Not onto the mountain, not on top of the mountain, but into the mountain. We're talking a cave. Um, and it came to pass that I arose and went up into the mountain and cried unto the Lord. So, portals, places of, uh, that are spiritually significant, that's a physical place um, where, where there can be a connection to the spirit. Now, some people might think that a portal uh, can be created uh, by just the individual and, and the place doesn't really matter. Others might say, there are specific places that do matter that are sacred, that have significance, and it's those sites where significant things can happen. I personally believe there's a combination of both. I think there are sacred, sacred sites that have significant energy in them and or portals. I think there's also the ability where God can communicate wherever a man or a woman is and and reveal things to them um but but definitely there are energy there's there's energy and and uh places of of spiritual significance that that act as portals uh and are their physical places that's that's what i believe now Nephi went in a cave. He came out of that cave knowing how to build a ship and, 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 and obtaining tools and uh, uh, making tools and just all kinds of things. You know, Now, Nephi was a very uh, righteous individual and very open to revelation in the spirit. But nonetheless, he went into this, he was told to go to a specific place. And I think this place had significance. Um, you can you can uh, look this up, but Leonardo 
let me start that. Leonardo da Vinci had a similar experience. He he went into a cave and, and he was, he, Leonardo, uh, many people, historians feel like he, he basically disappeared for a couple of years. And in, in during this time, he spent some time in a cave. And when he came out of that cave, he had, he had this knowledge that was way ahead of his time. And, and you can see the things that he invented. He was not only just the, one of the most brilliant artists in both painting and sculptor, sculpt, sculpture, but, um, but mechanics, science, the body, the, the, how things work. I mean, the guy was way ahead of his time. Tanks and submarines and mechanic animals, mo movement, and uh, just, just amazing things. And, and, and we had this period of time, you know, the Renaissance, you, you, you had uh, Michelangelo and, and Raphael and others that, that were all in the same area. You know that there was some significance going on in, in that area. Um, we've been there. We've, we've seen those sites. We've, we've gone to, to Venice. So we've gone to, to some of these and, and, and the art galleries and the places and, and seen the sculptures and and the Piazza and David and, and others that you just, you did, and Moses, you look at these, these sculptures and just are, it, you're, you're in awe. Uh, the knowledge, the understanding, and then, then you have the, the, uh, um, the revival, the, the um, Reformation going on at the same time where people have access to scriptures and knowledge and learning and, and things are changing. Well, I we've been to places and many of you have been there as well but you can feel the energy of some of these places and the significance and some of them have to do with with religious and spiritual sites and I'll talk about that and some some might not necessarily but you still feel um I'm thinking of the great pyramid of Giza Soon I went inside the Great Pyramid and, and into the King's Chamber, what they call the King's Chamber. And I'm telling you, you feel an energy. You feel that this is a place of significance. The, 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 uh, they call it a sarcophagus. I don't think it was, but inside of granite, just beautiful. And do you know it's the same dimension of the Ark of the Covenant that's inside the King's Chamber? There's so many significant... There's, there's, there's um, tunnels that, that go through, that the engineering uh, of the Great Pyramid go through and they point to certain constellations. Um, we, we have the solstices, we have um, north and south, we have the circumference of the earth and all these things measured in the pyramid. You can't tell me that it isn't the center of something, uh, of the earth mass perhaps, and, and uh, the Many of these sites are on, on a, 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 you know, you can call them ley lines or electrical lines or power lines that, that are running through the earth and they, and they connect. Um, you, you, have, you have the pyramids of Giza in, in this boom, boom, and then ah, uh, uh, depicting like the, the, the sword or Orion's belt, Orion's belt, okay? Um, then you go to Teotihuacan in Mexico and you have the Pyramid of the Sun, Moon and that. And it's the same thing. Um, and the footprint of both pyramids, the one in Giza and the one in uh, uh, Mexico, same footprint. These things aren't by mistake. There's a connection. Um, just last fall, we were in uh, England and we went to Stonehenge and we were able to go get up early, early in the morning and have a private tour to go right in among the stones. You feel it. I can't deny a feeling. And, 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 and some of these are positive and some of these are negative. And th these ley lines and they go through, there, there's, you can look this up, but um, uh, the, there, there's like a dozen or more ley lines that go right through Stonehenge. So we know that this was a significant place. Um, the, uh, so, so Mexico and, and, uh, 
Egypt, feeling these things. Stonehenge, uh, Petra, seeing, seeing, trying to figure out how these people did this. You know, what they call the treasury. You know, you see it on Indiana Jones. When you come around the corner and the guide we had, he said, he said, just kind of keep your eyes closed or look down on the ground until I tell you. And you come around a corner. It's kind of, you kind of feel like you're in a, a slot canyon down in, in Zions or somewhere, you know, in Utah. And you come around and you look and there is the treasury. It's, it's breathtaking. And you feel it. You feel it. Now, going to religious sites, spiritual sites. Oh my goodness. We can go to church history. We can go to places, like the sacred grove. You'll feel it. Sorry about Tucker barking. Um, you, you go to Adam on Diamond. You feel it. You feel the significance of that area. You go uh, to Liberty, Liberty Jail. You go to uh, Independence, Missouri. Uh, you go to Nauvoo and a short distance away, Carthage. And you feel the significance of that. You feel the, um, excuse me just a second. He'll, he'll probably keep barking and I apologize. But you go, you go to these sites and you know that there's a, an, an energy there that's significant. It's not just, oh yeah, something kind of cool happened here. No, no. It's Hill Camora, Palmyra, all, you, you know, these, these places, you'll feel it. If you, if you get a chance, you know, you go there, you just have to feel it and see it and experience it. Smell, taste, you know, the, what's around you. Uh, Carthage to me was, um, incredible experience been there a couple of times and you go there and you just feel what the events that took place there and you know that it's sacred now i feel that way with every temple i've been to and i haven't been to like i haven't done a world tour of temples but i've been to a, you know a fair amount and i feel that that they're a conduit or a portal and I feel like there's significance to the sites. Now, I know some sites have, you know, people have protested and things have changed. I get that. But I think there's some significance to that. Now, Israel, to me, it's like the whole land is full of this spiritual energy. And, and having the feeling of, of perhaps walking right where the Savior walked and knowing that where he put his footprints is a portal, is sacred ground where events took place. Um, you know, sometimes you know pretty close to where things happen. Sometimes it's like, oh, in the general area. And other times it's, it's like we feel that it's somewhere around here kind of thing. Uh, whether, regardless of that, it's, it's amazing. I, if, I, I can't imagine, uh, if I had the opportunity to go to Israel and I didn't take it, I can't imagine how disappointed I'd be in myself. It took us years to get there. It was after we served our mission, uh, one of our, our where we presided over a mission, we just, we're going to do it, you know. We did it with my sister and her husband, and it was an amazing, amazing experience. And then I went back again with my son, and then I went back again. Sue and I went back again last last fall, or, well, two fall, so a, a little over a year ago. And looking forward to going this fall. Um, I uh, got some information from... Uh, Pastor Todd Fink that uh, is that we went on our last tour with for I think it was 17 days all in Israel and they're going this spring and the, the places that they won't be able to go 
are Caesarea Philippi, way up north, because of all the crap going on there. Uh, they won't be going to Hebron, and they won't be going to Shechem. Those are hot spots. So they won't be going to those, but everywhere else they'll go. Sea of Galilee, all of Jerusalem, and many other areas in between. So um, these are portals, folks. And you can think of it as, you know, like hocus pocus kind of stuff. Uh, or you can think that there are actual sites on earth that were there for a specific reason and a specific purpose. Personally, I don't think it was just by chance that the Savior ended up in the Holy Land. And he made it holy, but it was by design, in my opinion. It wasn't by chance that that's where he was born, performed the atonement, lived his earthly life, performed miracles, did everything. And, and if we don't get a chance to go, the Lord will make it up to us. Trust me. And I would say a temple is, is where we have an opportunity to go into the portal and be connected in so many different ways, if we're prepared, if we're prepared. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Uh, Nephi was definitely in a portal when he went into that cave. And uh, uh, there's so many other things to talk about in our reading. I mean, my goodness, it's just, it's just crazy. But um, I, the Liahona to me is one of the most unique things because um, it just shows up. Lehi doesn't have to do anything other than it says right before, right before it says the Liahona showed up, it said Lehi uh, fulfilled everything he was asked to do up to that point. And then I think the Lord just went, you know what, I'm going to give him something pretty cool because he's, he's really gone out on a limb here. So I'm going to give him this brass ball with spindles and a curious workmanship, and I'm just going to provide it. He's not going to have to go do anything. I'm just going to give it to him. And, and I, I look forward to those kind of things where we put forth an effort, we do the things we're supposed to do, and then we wake up one day and go, dang, look at this. Um, I, I just, uh, I'm looking forward to that. Well, God bless. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, <clears throat> Sue is in Texas. Our little Jane is not doing very well right now. She had a major setback. And so thoughts and prayers would be much appreciated. Um, I don't know. These, these roller coasters that we go through in life, um, they, they really have us dig deep. And that's the blessing uh, where we rely on the Lord. Um, I'll fill you in later on and, and let you know what's happening. But um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it is what it is. God bless. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.